Good evening, guys. How are you? Um, welcome. Can't believe it's May. Um, yeah, May. Orioles are in second place um, as of the moment. Um, the only thing I have to, I'm obligated to tell you is for those who are interested in going to Sabre 51 in Chicago, the early bird special ends Friday, I believe. So prices will go up. Uh, the registration price goes up after that. But um, other than that, I don't have any other administrative uh, announcements. Um, I'm gonna let uh, Dan take over. I believe he lives in North Jersey. Um, and uh, he'll tell you about his newest book. I knew I had one of yours because your name always rung a bell, even though I know you from Sabre. I have your 300 club one. So if you're in Chicago, I'm, I'm bringing you, have you sign that. Um, but um, I'll let Dan introduce himself, talk about his most recent work. And uh, guys, you know the drill, any questions put it in the chat or we'll wait till the, uh, the end of the presentation. Go right ahead, Dan. Okay, thank you very much. And hi, guys. Good to see you tonight's crowd. Ken, and there are more people cropping up. Anyway, this is the book right here. It's called Baseball's Memorable Misses, an unabashed look at the game's craziest zeros. The original title of this book was Baseball Zeros, but the marketing people at sports publishing thought that was kind of a negative approach. And I insisted the word zeros be somewhere in the title, and it is, because every line in this book begins with the number zero, such as zero Cy Youngs for Nolan Ryan, zero RBI titles for Willie Mays, zero home run crowns for Stan Musial, zero pennants for the Seattle Mariners, zero intentional walks for Roger Maris when he hit 61 and 61. That's the gist of the book. It's things that people assume happened in baseball that actually did not. And I found that there are hundreds of these things. And as I got into it, I really had a good time writing it. And it's written with tongue in cheek. And those of you that know of the artist Ronnie Joyner, a great baseball cartoonist, his cartoons still appear in Sports Collectors Digest every week. Ronnie let me use all of his cartoons. I took out all the writing that surrounds his figures and I used the images only and no writing and supply my own captions. And I was very grateful to Ronnie Joyner. And a lot of you guys know Doug Lyons because he, he was a Sabre regular for years. Very funny guy, the brother of TV critic and movie critic Jeffrey Lyons. And Doug wrote the forward for me. I wanted somebody to write a funny forward, somebody who knows me and who knows baseball. And nobody is more qualified than Doug Lyons. So I remember being at many Sabre conventions when he was listed as a presenter People were anxious to get into his room. His rooms were always booked. And one time I was a presenter and I was presenting against Doug. And I said, nobody's gonna come to see me. They're all gonna go see Doug. Because Doug is a really funny guy and really knows the stuff. So very grateful for that support. Right now I'm working on two new books. One is called The New Baseball Bible. And that is gonna be a 2025 update of the one that came out in 2020. It was originally known as the Baseball Catalog back in 1980 when it was a Book of the Month Club alternate. And the other book, just signed a contract to do this one, is called Home Run King, The Remarkable Record of Hank Aaron. And I'm pretty sure that many of you are traditionalists and purists, and you agree with me that Hank Aaron is the real home run king. And I've already been doing some interviews for that book. Talked to Jim Cott yesterday, talked to Davey Johnson today, Talk to Fred McGriff today. They all agree Hank Aaron is the home run king, not somebody named Barry out in San Francisco. So this book was a lot of fun. This was a different approach for me. I've written more than 40 books now, but this was the first one that was really tongue in cheek, a fun book to write, very funny to come up with some of these zeros. For example, 0. .000. That was the team batting average of the Chicago White Sox the day after Bob Feller threw his opening day no-hitter in 1940. And how about 00? zero? Uniform number first worn by Paul Dade, who otherwise would be totally forgotten in baseball history. And almost zero, the number of strikeouts Joe Sewell had in 1932 when he actually struck out three times, but that's almost zero when you consider how many times people are striking out these days. 
So this was fun. This was great. I enjoyed it. My editor and I had a lot of good laughs over it. And unfortunately, she just retired. Julie Gantz at Sports Publishing just retired to raise her family, just recently had her second child. So she's out of the publishing business, but sports publishing is still going strong. And I'm working with them on both of the other two books that I just mentioned. By the way, the Hank Aaron book, Dusty Baker, who's a longtime friend of mine, has agreed to write the foreword of that book. So I'm very honored by that. And I'll be talking to lots of people. Looking forward to it. And we'll be talking to Dusty to work on the forward with him. When I texted Dusty to ask him to write the forward, he wrote back immediately, I'll do it if you help me. So of course I'll help him. I'm not going to let him struggle by himself to do that. So when Dusty has time, we're going to talk to him about his actually being in the on deck circle on April 8th in 1974 when Hank Aaron broke the record. So that was pretty significant. Daryl Evans was on base. Dusty Baker was in the on deck circle and Davey Johnson was in the hole. So those are three pretty good guys. And I was lucky enough to have all of them, including Hank Aaron and manager Eddie Matthews, sign a copy of my book, Hammer and Hank, The Henry Aaron Story, which was the first book that came out in 1974 ahead of him breaking the home run record. And a rare book dealer told me that that book, because of those autographs, is worth at least $600, which is probably 100 times more than I paid for it. So I thought that was pretty good. So I will be happy to answer any questions to talk more about this book, to talk more about other projects or what I've done with Sabre. Let me just brief you. I, I've been a Sabre member since 1981. I've been to many conventions and I'll try to list some of them alphabetically. Albany, Atlanta, Baltimore, Boston, Chicago, the last time that we were there, Cleveland, and many, many others. There are lots of them. I've been to a lot of Saber conferences. Unfortunately, I will not make it to Chicago this year because I have to go cover the All-Star Game in Seattle. There's a two-day overlap at the back end of the Saber conference. And that's unfortunate, but got to be in Seattle for the All-Star Game and for the whole All-Star break. I write for Forbes. I'm a national baseball writer for Forbes. I write 10 columns a month for Forbes. I can write whatever I want, but I have to keep producing or I lose my job. And I don't want to do that because that's a lot of fun. So I'll be happy to take questions from anybody out there. Anybody have anything to ask? I see a nice group of 10 people out there. Jump right in, anybody. Okay, I'll, I'll ask a question to you guys. I understand that this is being held in the, in the brewery. What, what is that all about? Peter, you want to explain that to me? Uh, did you come to Baltimore last year for the convention? Yes, yes. I did come to Sabre in Baltimore. I was in the vendor's room. Okay. Did you, um, if you didn't go on the, um, the ballpark tour, um, the site of, I'm actually at home tonight. I don't know if anybody's actually at the brewery, but uh, Peabody Heights Brewery, sits on the site of Oriole Park 5 that burned down in 1944. Um, and we have our annual chapter meeting uh, at the brewery every January or February. Owner of the brewery was our chapter treasurer for several years. Um, so it's in the uh, technically the Waverly neighborhood um, in, in Baltimore and in the area, um, for those of who, who know Baltimore pretty well, the, that neighborhood is the site of a lot of those old, old ballparks going back to the uh, the 1800s that are obviously long gone. And the uh, Peabody Heights Brewery sits on the site of uh, what was Oriole Park. Fund. Well, I'm very grateful to the Orioles and to Major League Baseball for building that ballpark because it was the inspiration for so many other new parks with a retro look. And it really reminds me most of Coors Field in Denver because you can walk, you can stay in a hotel downtown and walk to the game. And I think that's fabulous. Same thing in Denver. Anybody Anybody have a question? Yeah. Yeah. You know, what did you find is the, uh, the, the, the most unusual uh, uh, near miss that you, you have in this? Was there anything that, that shocked even you? Some of the ones you mentioned before were, were pretty incredible. I was curious what your thoughts were on the, the most uh, that normal one. I think I can give you that answer. 
zero for zero times that zero mustel throughout the first ball at a game. Zero mustel, the actor, Fiddler on the Roof, mm -hmm. never threw out the first ball at a game. So that was zero. <laughs> and that was kind of interesting. Also, zero times that Jack Norworth went to a game before writing Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Now, what's interesting about that is he wrote that song in 1908. There was no TV. There was no radio. What inspired him to write Take Me Out to the Ball Game? He had never seen a game. And any other or just papers? <laughs> I don't know. He did actually go to a game 34 years later after writing that song, which, of course, has become the most famous song in baseball. They play it in the seventh inning stretch at so many different ballparks, including City Field in New York. I'm based in northern New Jersey. I'm right outside New York. I went to the openers of both the Mets and the Yankees. I went to three games of the Braves Mets series. They're supposed to play four, but they had a big problem with rain. Rained out Saturday, rained out Sunday, shortened to five innings on Friday, doubleheader Monday. So I went to three of those games. And I saw Ronald Acuna get hit in the shoulder with the first pitch of game two after three Mets were hit in game one. But it was interesting that no umpires were warned. Nothing was happened. No pitchers were warned. And I was, I was just surprised that, that the umpires didn't do anything about it. The managers just continued to play. Acuna left the game. I thought at the time, because I could hear it up in the press box, I thought he broke his shoulder or his collarbone and was going to be out for months. It turned out it was just a contusion. He actually played yesterday. He did not miss any games other than the second game of the doubleheader on Sunday, Monday. That was it. So I guess if you're 24, 25 years old, you're, you've got a tough skin and you can withstand stuff like that. I know I couldn't. Anybody else with any questions, comments? You guys are quiet tonight. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to stir you guys up. Karen, you want, have something yeah. you want to say? I have a, um, I had heard that he, the person who wrote Take Me Out to the Ball Game, wrote it in honor of, in memory of Trixie Verganza. Oh, that's good. Because he was having an affair with her and his wife, he had never seen, he wrote it because he loved her. His wife found out, left him, and then he left Trixie and married somebody else. Oh, wow. That's interesting. That could wind up on TV one of these days. <laughs> if, you, if you see her on YouTube, I don't know how you would even think of it. But she's an interesting character. But I mean, when you were talking about that, that's what I heard about it. Okay. Well, that's good. I, I pick up little tidbits everywhere. I read everything about baseball online, in print, watch everything. I have no interest in any other sport. I've never seen a Super Bowl by choice. <laughs> Deliberately, I hate football with a passion. <laughs> because it interferes with baseball. Anything that interferes with baseball, I don't like it. <laughs> so, in fact, I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm working on this Hank Aaron book now. When he hit his 711th home run in Atlanta, the last week of the 73 season, that was the smallest crowd they got in the ballpark in Atlanta all year. Here's a guy going for Babe Ruth's record. He's only a few home runs away, and nobody turned out to see it. So I asked people, what happened? They said, oh, it's a football town. Well, <laughs> not when you have somebody going for that record. I don't think so. And I'll tell you another story about Aaron and the record. I was interviewing him in the clubhouse after a game when the governor of Georgia came in and said, pardon me. And I said, of course, it was Jimmy Carter. <laughs> and Aaron went to greet Carter and they were very pleasant. A photograph was taken of Aaron and Carter shaking hands. I am directly over Aaron's right shoulder, very visible. I did not know that photograph was taken until about a month ago. 
on MLB.com, I was reading Mark Bowman's Braves Beat column, and there's the photograph. So now I'm asking Mark Bowman, how do I get permission to reprint that in my Hank Aaron book? It might be public domain, I don't know, but I'm, I really like to reprint that. I also have a picture, which is not for the Hank Aaron book, but it's just an unusual picture of the Griffiths, junior and senior in Braves uniforms. Now, the reason is Ken Griffey Sr. was playing for the Braves. Griffey Jr. hadn't signed yet, but he wanted to work out with his dad at the Atlanta ballpark. So he came there, they gave him a Braves uniform, and there he is. He's about maybe 16 years old in that picture. The two Griffeys in Braves uniforms. You'll never see that anywhere. <laughs> I love oddities. In fact, I teach a college course at Bergen Community College. It's called the Institute for Learning and Retirement. It's all for people 55 and up. Name of my course is Baseball Ironies and Oddities. <laughs> it's a four, four one hour sessions. Tomorrow is my last class. My speaker is going to be Chris Lucas, who is the son of blind, the late blind sportscaster, Ed Lucas. They wrote a book together called Seeing Home. Ed was an amazing character. He went to 63 consecutive Yankees openers. That's a record, nobody has come close. Not even Bob Shepard. 63 consecutive Yankees openers. Pretty but to impressive. me, Ed Lucas was amazing because he always said to me that his blindness was a nuisance, not a handicap. He refused to acknowledge that it was a handicap. He graduated from college. He had three sons, he had grandchildren. He had three marriages. Two to the same woman. So he was an amazing character for sure. And his best friend was Phil Rizzuto. Um, have you ever considered a book on Dusty Baker? I actually have asked Dusty, when I asked him to do the forward of the Hank Aaron book, I said, I would like to do your book with you. He didn't respond to that question, but when I contact him again to actually work on the forward of the book, I will ask him again. I know that he likes me all I can. We've been friends since he was a rookie and I wrote a magazine article entitled The Next Hank Aaron. It was supposed to be Dusty Baker. He wasn't quite that good, but he wasn't bad. No, he had a nice career and he finally got that World Series ring as a manager too, so they like put him over. <clears throat> That's true. That, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was a slight problem with this book because I originally had zero World Series rings as a manager for Dusty Baker. That had to change. I'm glad it changed because, you know, he deserved that after all this time. He, he was setting all kinds of records for losing and that's not good. But the year they played the Braves, I knew that the World Series trophy would wind up in the Snitker house because Troy Snitker was Dusty's hitting coach in Houston, and Brian was the Braves manager. So this, somewhere along the line, the Snickers are gonna get that World Series trophy. Another thing that's interesting with the Aaron book, Hank had to cut his son, who was a minor league first baseman outfielder in the Braves system. He had to tell him, you're not gonna be a baseball player. His son couldn't hit, couldn't field, so he cut him. And Larry Aaron went on to be a groundskeeper with the Braves for a few years and then became a scout for 23 years for the Milwaukee Brewers. And he just retired from that job. So he made something of himself. He really did. Hank had six kids between his two marriages. I'm also lucky enough in doing research. I mean, at Sabre, we always talk about taking pride in research. I believe I have every Hank Aaron book ever published because I've been a fan of the Braves and Hank Aaron since 1957. And great research stuff, really, really good stuff to, to look into. Some of the books are old. I have an Eddie Matthews book, a Warren Spawn book, all kinds of stuff that I found really good Aaron stuff in. Anybody else, comments, questions? Anybody? How often do you guys meet? We do um, technically three times a month. We do this the first uh, Monday 
or excuse me, first Wednesday of the month at seven, we usually have a speaker. We do, uh, it's hybrid. Some people will go to the brewery, but you know, not too often. Um, and then we have a in-person called Shot Lunch, the third Wednesday of the month at the Babe Ruth birthplace. Um, and then nine out of 12 months, we have uh, the last Sunday of every month, we have uh, just kind of a, a round table, discussion, you know, uh, shoot the breeze kind of thing. So we're pretty, you know, pretty active. Um, for, for, you know, a chapter that's only not even eight years old, we're, uh, we've done pretty well for ourselves, so. No, that's good. That's great. I really enjoyed my visit to Baltimore for Sabre. There was a lot of enthusiasm, both for Sabre and for the Orioles in Baltimore. So it was nice. And I love the Inner Harbor anyway. Yeah, I mean, it, it's gone downhill for those of us who live in and around here. Uh, the downtown has taken a shellacking. Uh, Crime-wise, city leadership is horrible. And then, of course, the pandemic didn't help things. Um, but uh, so obviously the convention was delayed by what, two years? Um, had there not been a pandemic, we probably would have had 900 or 1,000 people. But wow. times, you know, the times were, they were last year. I think we had ended up having like 550. So uh, Saber headquarters was happy. Um, and I thought we did a, you know, a pretty good job, all things considered. I think you'll probably get 800, I'm guessing 800 to Chicago. Do you agree? I'm, I'm, yeah, the, the, I think the record currently is, was the, um, the one in Manhattan in 17. So, um, yeah, I was there. Yeah, that was good. That was a good one. And, um, so I don't, you know, a lot of it depends on the speakers and, you know, the world's a lot different than it was five years ago. So, yes. um, we'll see, you know, um, and, uh, you know, I know that they're taking bids for, for 24 already. So, um, uh, well, Baltimore will throw their hat back in the ring, but we'll we'll, we'll wait a couple of years. I wonder if they should hook on to the All Star Game and try to have it in the same city that the All Star Game is in, because it's more or less around the same time. It is, but the prices would be uh, ridiculously high for um, I think for lodging and, and 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 stuff. But you know, it's an idea to throw it out there to you know the the powers that be. Well, I, I would think that after the All-Star game is over and people leave, the prices would drop. Um, that's right. an idea. And yeah. that's why I think it would be fun. And people want to come early and go to the All-Star game or just to enjoy all the stuff going on connected to the All-Star game. Might be good. At, you know, it might be a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I, remember they... Saber, I remember having a Sabre in Toronto that I think was in a college dorm. We stayed in a college dorm in, in 81 or 82, something like that. A long time ago. Yeah, the, the first Baltimore one in 82, I think it was, wasn't actually in the city. It was on uh, Towson University's campus from what I was told. So. Yeah, yeah. I think I went to that one too. I go to as many as I can when they, if they don't conflict with the Hall of Fame inductions or the All-Star Game. Yeah. So those are my two considerations. The All-Star Game is in Seattle this year. Hall of Fame inductions, they only have two guys going in. That, that was a major disappointment to me, especially with Todd Helton. Let me talk about that for a second. There were 16 ballots that were blank, that were returned blank. If 11 of those 16 writers had voted for Todd Helton, he'd be going into the Hall of Fame this year. That's how close he was to getting in. And he wound up with 72, more than 72% of the votes. So it's almost a lock for next time around. I'm, I'm a believer in a larger hall. I think that either the 75% thing should be lowered or they should make everybody fill out their ballots completely with 10 names. Because if guys only vote for zero, one or two candidates, it skews the whole 75% system. The all-star, the MVP ballot has 10 spots on it. If you do not fill out your ballot completely, your ballot is disqualified. Hall of Fame to me should be the same system. I, think just, I, I was just going to say it, I'm completely on the opposite end of that. Okay. I'm a small hall guy. <laughs> well, I think the Hall of Fame is probably the most controversial thing in baseball yeah. in general. It stirs up the most arguments. 
I have a Barry Bloom, a Sportico writer, is a very close friend of mine. We've been very good friends for years and years. He insists he will never vote for Andrew Jones. I think Andrew Jones should have been a first ballot electee. I mean, he's going to get in in two years, the way things are going. But 10 gold gloves in a row, that's rare. The gold gloves weren't always, uh, I don't know what to say, legitimate. Sometimes a lot of gold gloves were given out to guys that actually hit better. <laughs> I know it's not supposed to uh, affect it, but gold gloves are, aren't always a, a measurement of their true. I know he was a great player, but it, but I don't use gold gloves very much. Well, that's just one small aspect of his, yeah. you know, what he did. But there are only four other outfielders in baseball history who won 10 in a row. And they're pretty good names. Ken Griffey mm -hmm. is one. Ichiro is one. Roberto Clemente and Willie Mays. So not bad company. I, 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 not that I agree, but I understand the metrics don't say that Griffey was that great. Okay, well, Bobby Cox told me that he thought Andrew was better than Willie Mays, and he saw them both. So oh, well, yeah. that, was his, that was his opinion, but other people have said similar things. Yeah, but A.O. and Bobby Cox's hat might have biased him a little bit. Yeah, well, that's probably true. But if you ask Maddox, Glavin, and Smoltz, they, they'll tell you they wouldn't be in the Hall of Fame without Andrew Jones. So, you know, he was like the equivalent. I guess, in, in center field of Ozzie Smith at shortstop. But you, you can argue for or against guys. Your guys in the Hall of Fame probably should not be there. Uh, for example, yeah. <laughs> a really good example is Rick Farrell. His brother uh, should have been there. That's one, too. That's the first one I His always His brother bring should have been there, not him. <laughs> <laughs> and how about Mazeroski? He's there for one home run in the World Series. Yeah, and, and the... And those, uh, Del Rosudo and, uh, Pee Wee? Yeah, Pee Wee, both of them, yeah, both of them. Yeah, Pee well, there are some people who think that Mazeroski was one of the best fielding second basemen ever. Well, so that's, yeah. go with the Golden Glove argument. Yeah, yeah. well, Nellie Fox is there for that, too, I guess, because he had no power whatsoever. He was a pretty good hitter. Yeah. Aparicio, too, you could argue against well, him, but stole a lot of bases. And there was a bunch of them in that when Frankie Frisch was on the Veterans Committee. Yeah, the, the Veterans Committee, that changes each year. The yeah, Veterans yeah. Committee changes. And it kind of depends who gets appointed to the committee, who gets into the Hall of Fame. I, I was so surprised that McGriff won unanimously 16 to nothing. He got all 16 votes in the panel. And, you know, I thought Mattingly was going to get in. I thought Dale Murphy was going to get in. I thought those three would get in. Oh, they didn't. I did not think like Bonds and Clemens would get in, and they did not. And I don't know if they ever will. Yeah. And that'll depend a lot on who's on the committees. <laughs> I, th I think as the years go on, it, it reduces the chances of, of Bonds and Clemens. They, they were both Hall of Famers before they started allegedly juicing. However, they tainted the game's history. To me, that's, that's a no-no. Yeah. yeah, well, I agree with that, yeah. You know, in the last couple of days when I talked to Jim Cott and Fred McGriff and Davey Johnson, they all said the same thing. They said Hank Aaron is the hormone champion. Bonds cheated. <laughs> that's, that's what they said. <laughs> do, do you go up to the Hall of Fame Classic Memorial Day weekend? I don't go to that, but I am going to speak at the Hall of Fame on July 6th. I'm doing a PowerPoint presentation and signing Ooh. books on July 6th. And then okay. I'll be up there again for the inductions. Yeah, I go, I go up every year to the Classic now. <laughs> It's not as crowded as the induction ceremonies, and it's it's really a fun weekend. I bet it is. I, I'm sure it is. Yeah. And you mentioned Jim Cott. Jim Cott's going to be there this year. Oh, he's great. Jim is fabulous. He is such a good baseball historian. I complimented on that. I said, how did you learn all this stuff? He said, my dad loved baseball, and he knew everything about baseball history. Oh, my gosh. Ooh. So he imbued it in Jim. I mean, Jim knows stuff way back when. Just incredible. We had a great discussion. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I what told I said to Jim, I said, most former 
Most active players have no idea of baseball history. They don't know who Jackie Robinson was. They don't know who Hank Aaron was. And Jim said, you're right. But a few teams like the Dodgers and the Twins have historians. And they make those guys know. And Jim suggested he had a really good idea. He said that 17-minute multimedia show that opens the Hall of Fame, um, you know, like the opening to the Hall of Fame. Like, when you first go there, they urge you to see right. the orientation movie. He said every team should see that. Yeah. He's right. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah. I, I like the fact that a lot of teams that visit Kansas City bring the uh, people out to the uh, Negro Leagues Museum. Yes, that's a great museum. And I hear they're looking yeah. for a new new location for that. Well, they're... I saw something that they were raising m money to build build a new one now. Yes, yeah. yes, that's correct. And I saw the design of it. It's really nice looking. Yeah, they did the one that exists now is terrific. I really liked yeah, it. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah. And there's so many museums for players, like the Yogi Berry Museum, which is close to where I live. Really like that one. And there's so many others for players that are really good. Of the current players, who do you think has the best appreciation for the history of the game? That's a really good question. I have to think about that one. Really good question. Uh, current players. You know what? I'm going to go with Max Scherzer. Only because he's a very you know, intelligent guy. Always thinks before he speaks. He's, he was on that executive committee of the Players Union. I know he voted for the lockout to continue, but that's not my point here. He just really, he really knows about baseball history. And I guess if you're going to be involved in labor negotiations, you should know about baseball history. Although personally speaking, I do not think Marvin Miller should be in the Hall of Fame. Oh, good. That's, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll I tell agree. You why. Marvin Miller went 0 for 7 in his first seven tries. What changed? There's no category for him. There was no category for Absolutely. a labor leader. He was not a baseball executive. He wasn't a player or a manager. They should have categories for things like coaches and scouts and maybe miscellaneous. That would be where Marvin Miller would fit. Well, but and Yeah, I was told, totally against he, that. <laughs> he told the Veterans Committee not to vote for him, if you remember. Well, That's when they well, elected after, him. Even after he passed, didn't his family say they weren't going to accept it yeah something like that because marvin had previously said he did not want to go in well i thought he, he only didn't want to go in if he wasn't elected while he's alive yeah it unfortunately happened to many many people mm -hmm. but i'll tell you one guy who should be in who i don't like at all <laughs> but he's made, he made a major impact on baseball scott boris major impact mm -hmm. on baseball as much as marvin miller Look at the Would salary. In the same miscellaneous category without a, a place in the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, no, there's no place prices. for him. Unless you consider him an executive or maybe a pioneer, pioneer agent. I don't know. But how about how about the coaches? There are no coaches in the Hall of Fame. There are no scouts in the Hall of Fame. There's something missing here. Those categories need to be set up. Yeah. What do you think about Bill James? Oh, he's yeah. another one. He could be possibly in the pioneer category. Or maybe the writer's award, because he has done a lot of writing, books and things. Yes. But I love, my one of my favorite books that I get every year is that Bill James Handbook. I love that book. Great for research. Really, it's at my fingertips every single day. And really helpful. Any other comments, anybody? Are there some famous Orioles you'd like to see in the Hall of Fame that aren't there? Uh, no, I think the I think the ones that deserve it are in. Bobby Chris. I'm thinking, how about somebody like Dave McNally, who was like, no. you know, with that holdout in 19, you know, that 60. What, what year was well, that? I, I wouldn't use that for or against him. I, I, I'm just talking about his playing career. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But when the Orioles had those 420 game winners, Mike yeah. Coyar was a great pitcher. Yeah, they were all great, but not not quite Hall of Fame caliber, except for Palmer. <laughs> yeah. 
Hal Palmer was great. Yeah. And Palmer could have been had by the Kansas City Royals or any of those expansion That's teams because right. he was left unprotected. I, I, had a, I had an argument with a guy that sits next to me at Camden Yards, and he couldn't couldn't believe that the Orioles exposed him. <laughs> he, he actually Mariano didn't believe Rivera. Mariano Rivera was un unprotected by the Yankees for an expansion draft. Nobody took him. He was only left unprotected for one round, but that's all it would have taken. But, uh, and Roberto Clemente was a rule five. That's right. That's right. <laughs> the Do the Dodgers signed him. You never know where these guys are going to come from or when they're going to start to get good or how long they're going to last. And I'm wondering right now, is anybody going to sign Madison Bumgarner? Oh. Look at the guy's record. I predict, I, read, I just saw an article about this for Forbes. I predict he's going to be signed by the Texas Rangers because Bruce Bochy is their manager. And mm -hmm. they were together in San Francisco, as you remember. And the pitching coach there is Mike Maddox. And he works miracles with guys. So I think that'd be a very good signing for Madison Bungwater. Mm -hmm. And for the Rangers, especially with DeGrom was being hurt. When did it have happened by now? What do you think they're waiting on? Because they can oh, get I him for the, the I think he's, major league minimum. He, yeah, I know, but he's probably sorting his bids and figuring out who's going to, you know, how he's going to fit in. For example, if if the Braves would sign him, he'd be a relief pitcher. I don't know if he wants to do that. There is no room in that rotation. But if the Yankees or Mets signed him, he'd be a starting pitcher. He's got to sign with a team that has a lot of offense because – his ERA is probably going to be like four and a half at best. He needs a lot of support. Texas has a lot of support. You know, they're a good run scoring team. Another possibility, and this is not a team that gives you a lot of support, would be the Oakland A's, only because he's so well known in the Bay Area. You know, he might put some fans in the seats. I don't know. They need every fan they can get out there before they move to Las Vegas. <laughs> I think it's too late for that for them. Yeah. And speaking about the Hall of Fame again, and guys who shouldn't be in, how about Roberto Alomar in the wake of his personal behavior right. in the last couple of years? I mean, the Toronto Blue Jays basically just made their distance from him. They took him out of their Hall of Fame. I think they oh, unretired his retired number. Really? I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, they did all kinds of things. They were so embarrassed by Roberto Alomar's behavior. You know, it, with, whenever you know, I mention that, you know, whenever I talk about Roberto, somebody says, well, how about Ty Cobb and Roger Schwarzman? They weren't oh. any angels either, you know? <laughs> True. But uh, Ty Cobb now has a new... Uh... I don't know what you call a new description of his personality with the latest that Charles Lerson book. I met his granddaughter at the Hall of Fame. And she was in the she was in the process of defending his reputation. So not surprised. I, I also know Charlie Finley's niece very well, Nancy Finley. And she's spoken at the Hall of Fame. Her father, Carl, really ran the A's when Charlie was the owner. But he was an absentee owner. But Nancy thinks both her father and Charlie should be in the Hall of Fame. I kind of agree with her on Charlie. Remember, they won three straight world championships. And five straight divisions. Not bad for a one-man show in the front office. And how about George Steinbrenner? I mean, I didn't like George Steinbrenner at all, but he really made an impact on the game. Well, it's going to be very interesting in December of this year because the Contemporary Baseball, you know, Veterans Committee, whatever it is, the latest offshoot, they're voting for non-players this year. And there's a good chance they'll pick at least three managers. I'm thinking Davey Johnson, Lou Pinella and Jim Leland, those three guys could be picked by that committee. But they'll also be considering owners. You know, anybody who's a non-player. So yeah. it could be interesting. Finley, Steinbrenner, I know they had the rule about the being out of baseball. 
I'm and sorry, go ahead. As a player, you, as a player, you have to be out of baseball for uh, seven years or so before you can be on the ballot. Is that true for managers? Would Dusty Baker Five be years. eligible for that? Well, Bruce Bochy would not be eligible because he's back. So he can't. Okay. I was asking that about Dusty Baker, come back, the same rule. Yeah. Right. If he had not okay. come back, he'd be a, a strong candidate, although he has a losing record as a manager. Yeah. But there are pictures in the Hall of Fame with losing records. There are at least four or five that I can think of. Mostly relief pitchers, I would assume. Well, Raleigh Fingers is one of them. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Satchel Page, and there are a few others. I think Bruce Souter may be one of them. I mean, Souter would go like 0 and 1 with, with 89 saves. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, whenever he met up with Ryan Sandberg, he didn't win. <laughs> Remember that game when Sandberg hit the two late inning home runs and beat Souter? Yeah. Great game. Great game in Ridley with the wind blowing out. <laughs> That's another thing from my book, by the way, Baseball's Marvelous Misses. Zero managers for the Chicago <laughs> Cubs from 1961 and 65. They had that rotating board of head yeah. coaches. And yeah. then finally, they hired Leo DeRocher as manager after that. But for five years, it was Elvin yeah. Tappy and <laughs> Beatty Himsel and Charlie Grimm and guys like that. Yeah, it was crazy. The Cubs weren't a very good team. I guess Phil Riggi was willing to try anything. But speaking of the Cubs, did you know that there were three fields named Wrigley Field? There was the one in Chicago. I know Chicago and L.A. What's the third yeah, one? Yeah, one no, the two. And the one on Catalina Island in California where they had spring training was also called oh. Wrigley Field. Yeah. Is, is that outside of San Diego? No, no, no. The Cubs trained in Catalina Island for about 30 years. I think they're, they left there in around 52, 53. But the Wrigley's owned the island. They own the whole island. Seems to. And, and the Cubs had been training there. Hmm. In fact, if you ever want a really enjoyable California vacation, I strongly recommend it. I've been there twice. It's Catalina Island. You know, 26 miles across the sea, there's a song about it. Sunny Catalina is waiting for me. Pretty good song. Beautiful place. No cars on the island. You have to drive around a golf course. <laughs> golf course. A walk. <laughs> there's, there's a barbershop. Anyway, I just did look up the... Has, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I did look up the four players with uh, losing, uh, four pitchers with losing records. You're right, they're all relievers. Lee Smith, Trevor Hoffman, Bruce Souter, and Rolly, Rolly Fingers. Yep. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. How, how about Hoyt Wilhelm? I don't uh, think he was a losing record. He was a starter for a while, too. Yeah, for, for a short period, he was a starter. But Pushed to no hitter. Yeah. Against the I'll Yankees. The second one is. Look up Satchel Page, too, while you're looking. So Hoyt Wilhelm was uh, 540 winning percentage. Oh, okay. He, uh, uh, 140, 143 wins, 122 losses. How about Sachs? Uh, okay, so the page might have been in there. I put a cutoff of 50 decisions. And so he may not have had 50 MLB decisions prior to. Uh, <laughs> well, if we're counting all the Negro League records, he had a plus 500 record. Yeah. So it kind of depends who's asking. <laughs> I met him, by the and way. That 50 decisions was a reasonable cutoff, but. Yeah, I met Satchel Paige in New York in 1969 when the Braves signed him so that he could qualify for the major league pension. He didn't pitch, but he was in uniform. Uh, I, and I have some pictures of him in a Braves uniform. I, I, ha I have, I saw him warming up in the bullpen at Forbes Field. <laughs> when I, I was out there, I, I, I was like, uh, a real young us, we were there to see the Braves and the, and the Pirates. And I just looked up and saw Paige warming up in the bullpen. I was with my father and said, that's Satchel warming up. So I ran down to the bullpen. I got a picture of him from the, from the back. And he's wearing number 65. And I said, his age. That, that's almost his age. <laughs> my bowling average. 
But he and Hank Aaron got into an argument over 75 cents when I was there. I was standing right in front of the dugout and Hank said, you owe me 75 cents. <laughs> I don't know what it was all about, but 75 cents? That was a big deal then? <laughs> Maybe it was. Okay, so, uh, Page, is listed, Page is listed as a 600 winning percentage because they combined Negro League and MLB oh, stats that's right. that's in baseball what I reference. Thought. Yeah. <clears throat> But I believe his major league record without the Negro Leagues would be under 500. Pretty sure. I'll pull it up. He pitched for the Browns for all those years. Just barely, 28 and 31. There you go. Pitched for the Browns before they became the Orioles. I don't think he ever pitched for the Orioles, though. Huh? No, he would, I think he was cut before spring training of 1954. Oh, okay. Uh, or cut or, or released or something. I don't know. He'd stop, stop being major league pitcher just before spring Don training. Arson? They kept Don Larson and went on to a 3-21 and record? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then that 17-player trade. And all oh, of a sudden, yeah. Don Larson was pretty good. Yeah, so his last uh, Page's last season was fifty three, and then he was released in February fifty four. Technically, yeah. they were the Baltimore Orioles then, but yeah, um, he it must have been pre spring training, <laughs> prior to spring training, I guess February second, yeah. a little early. And he did pitch yeah. three innings in nineteen sixty five for the Kansas City. Nice. Yeah. He scored those innings, by the way, against the Red Sox. <laughs> Talk about publicity stunts. <laughs> Well, I think if Bill Veck is in the hall, you got to put Charlie Finley there too. He was an innovator. He was abrasive. Nobody liked him, but he was an innovator. So, you know, Larry McPhail is in the Baseball Hall of Fame too. There are a lot of controversial guys in the hall. So we could thin the herd. I, I always tell people about 20% should be kicked out. <laughs> yeah, man, you're absolutely right. But there are also guys that should be in, I think. So sometimes, sometimes it's like luck of the draw. For example, when Dale Murphy first became eligible his first year, three guys were elected. There were Nolan Ryan, uh, Paul Molitor, I believe. No, um, not, not Paul. Nolan Ryan, Robin Yount, and George Brett came up against Dale Murphy. You know, I didn't think he was going to beat those three guys. But I'm surprised that Murphy didn't make it with the veterans this past time around because there was a lot of talk. Yeah. In this area here in the New York area, people always say, well, if you ask somebody who the three most evil men of the 20th century were, they'd say Hitler, Stalin, and Walter O'Malley. <laughs> Well, it's actually Did the Robert Giants Moses. already get a pass. Yeah, <laughs> it was Robert Moses who really did in the city of Brooklyn because they they could have had a new ballpark where Shea Stadium was built. Dodgers could have been, you know, they could have gone there, but they didn't want to leave Brooklyn. Ebbets Field was shabby and small and not drawing very well. But the Dodgers played all those games in Jersey City, 15 home games in Jersey City, as a warning to the Brooklyn City Fathers that if you don't support us, we're going to leave town. And that's exactly what happened. But, I, you know, I, I think it's great. I love doing research of all kinds. And every day I find stuff. I, I edit a newsletter. There's a, an organization called the Internet Baseball Writers Association of America. And I edit their newsletter. The newsletter comes out six times a week. I do the Friday and Saturday issues. It's called Here's the Pitch. And I write a column for each issue. There's also a guest column for each issue and a lot of trivia stuff. So if you want to check it out, it's IBWAA, I think it's .com or it could be .net. But Internet Baseball Writers Association of America, and it's here's the pitch. You might enjoy it. So take a look. 
Jim Cott is one of our fans. Yeah. <laughs> He's constantly writing me letters and emails. Oh, I enjoyed this, or I don't agree with this, or whatever. But, you know, at least it stirs up interest, and that's the main thing. And it's great for the off-season, too, because, you know, you want to talk baseball all year, not just during the season. Yeah. And, by the way, I gave, I gave this book, I gave a copy of it to the Mets radio guy, Howie Rose, before the game on Friday night. And the forecast was terrible for the weekend. The Friday game was shortened to five innings and then canceled by rain. Saturday and Sunday were both rained out. So before the game on Friday, when I gave Howie this book, he said, would you sign it to me? And I said, sure. And I wrote, to Howie, this book is great for rain delays. <laughs> sure enough. <laughs> Anything to get them to talk about the book, right? <laughs> did, did he mention it on the air? Not yet. Not that I've heard, but <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Howie's a friend. He, he wrote one of my forwards before. So oh. he's a friend. I also think he's probably the best radio announcer in, in the major leagues. Mm -hmm. He's really good. Even though I'm not a Mets fan, oh. he's a really good broadcaster. <laughs> Perhaps because he's not a former player. That's one of my pet peeves. Oh, wow. I, I believe that with few exceptions, oh. former players are not good announcers. Few exceptions. Jim Cott is a notable exception. You know, Jim Palmer is pretty good, I must admit. But there are few exceptions, in my opinion. More bad than good, many more bad than good. I mean, guys who root for the ball to go over the wall before it goes, give me a break. Just report it. <laughs> Not everybody who's listening is a fan of your team. It could be a fan of the opposition. What I find amazing is Bob Euchre still runs three miles a day. He's 89 years old. That's incredible. 89. I wish I could run three miles a day, and I'm I'm not 75. I'm not going to turn 75 till Saturday when Willie Mays turns 92. He's the <laughs> oldest living Hall of Famer. By the way, does anybody know the age, or I should say, does anybody know the name of the man who actually lived to be the oldest living Hall of Famer? He's he's gone now. Uh, not Eddie, Eddie Robinson. Not Eddie Robinson. No, 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 he's not in the Hall of Fame. Oh, oh Hall of Fame. You're, oh, you're talking Hall of Fame. Okay, I'm talking about generally. <laughs> oh, Hall of Fame. Sorry. This guy died fairly recently. Fairly recently. Let me let me give you a hint. Nobody has ever lived, no Hall of Famer has ever lived to 100. <laughs> but this guy came very close. Within, within less than a year. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. American League. <laughs> Bobby Doerr. There you go. All right. All right. Somebody would know. Somebody <laughs> opened the door. That's good. <laughs> that was Bobby Doerr. The last time I saw Hank Aaron at the Hall of Fame, I think it was 2019, I believe. Might have been 2018. He got the loudest and longest standing ovation of any of the Hall of Famers on the dais. That was just amazing. Fans <laughs> really showed him a lot of Respect and love and honor. I hope Barry Bonds was watching. <laughs> What's interesting about Barry Bonds, you look at the stats, he only hit 50 or more home runs once, and that was the year he had 73. To me, that, that stands out like a sore thumb. I mean, how did he do that? Especially playing in a ballpark, half his home, his home games, half the schedule, were in the toughest ballpark in the league for home runs. San Francisco is not, not a good ballpark for home runs, especially with the wind. Oh, speaking of the wind, I, you know I'm doing an Aaron, a book on Hank Aaron. He hit a ball that apparently was going to clear the left field wall during that 16-inning one-to-nothing game that Mays won with a home oh, run. Oh, yeah. The wind blew the ball back in, and Willie McCovey in left field caught it. It would have been a home run if the wind had been blowing in. Oh, my gosh. So I discovered that doing some research on the Hank Aaron book. 
Uh, I didn't realize McCovey played left field with those knees. Is that early in his career? Well, they had Cepeda, well, Cepeda at first base. They rotated those two guys. Neither one of them wanted to play left field. <laughs> but they did. And did you ever get Aaron to talk about the Harvey Haddix game? Actually, not that I remember. I, I can't remember ever asking him about the Harvey Haddock's game, but I know that that was a major faux pas of his career because he didn't, he, when the when Adcock's ball disappeared over the wall, he got excited and went directly from the second base to the dugout. So Adcock had his head down in his home run trot. The minute he passed Aaron, they called him out for passing a base runner, and the game was over. Felix Mantilla's run was the only run they counted, one nothing. Mm. Adcock got a double out of the deal. Should have been a home run. It was the only hit of the game. Gooper Dick gave up 12 hits, went all the way and got the win. 13 innings. And today with that Manford man ghost runner, <laughs> it would have gotten to be 13 innings. That is the worst rule in the history of baseball, by the way. The guy should be drawn and quartered. <laughs> Uh, it's like I a Sunday, seven any double header games are gone. <laughs> well, it's like a Sunday beer league. And by the way, if that is such a good rule, why don't they have it in the postseason too? <laughs> I rest my case. The no, I rest. agree. <laughs> That's really yeah. drastic. And if you have a bad bullpen or even a shaky bullpen, yeah, doesn't make sense. Anybody else have anything they'd like to ask or mention or anything? Yeah, I've got to run, but it was fun. Thank you, and uh, I, I'll look for your books. No, thanks very much. You can get it at Amazon.com, and it's cheap. $15 in the bookstore and less on Amazon. And I think you guys will enjoy it. And what's, what's amazing about this book is both a coffee table book and a bathroom book. You can leave it on your coffee table or leave it on top of the toilet and read it backwards, pick it up in the middle and still enjoy it. I thought phones have gotten rid of bathroom books. <laughs> Replace bathroom books, rather. Well, a lot of people read in the bathroom. You don't have to take the Sunday New York Times in there. Read my book instead. <laughs> All right. I try I'm not to spend not so much it. time in there. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm not going to make it to Chicago, guys. I'd love to see you all, but I'll see you next year, wherever it is. And if anybody goes to the All Star Game in Seattle, I'll see you there. All right. All right, all right guys. Well, thanks. This was great. Um, yeah, very good. Thanks, Dan. We'll definitely, hopefully, see you sometime soon at one of the big events. And uh, I'll be sending out an email with the uh, forthcoming uh, speakers and stuff probably in the next couple of weeks for the next few months. Yeah. Set them, set them up now. So, um, and Thank for you, those Peter. of you who are going to Chicago, uh, what are we? A little over two months away. So, um, I will be there. I think it's July fifth, right? So, yeah. yes, yes. So. Safe travels. Enjoy it. Make sure you take the uh, architectural tour on the Chicago River. It's wonderful. Yeah, I did that last convention. That was fun. Yeah. So. And the Palmer House is great. Right on the loop, you can take that. Chicago is the only city in the major leagues where one subway line connects two ballparks. The red line connects Wrigley Field and what used to be Comiskey Park. <laughs> I don't believe in the new corporate names. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, have a good night and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. And uh, hopefully uh, all our teams, no matter who you root for, you know, add to their uh, win columns. <laughs> That'll be great. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, thank good you. Night. Good night. Great, Dan.